been living in Croatia for the past 12 years and uh, I started, uh, like my, my passion for uh, space started completely accidentally and uh, I wanted to stay in touch with my home country, with Slovakia and I wanted to uh, do something uh, with space and uh, it started as a volunteering experience for Slovak Organization for Space Activities. Uh, I started doing some blogs and uh, the founder of Slovak Organization for Space Activities uh, asked me to join the Space Manic team. Uh, Space Manic is actually a currently nano satellite uh, solution provider and we are also a CubeSat component manufacturer. Uh, we have four satellites in orbit and we are launching one in 13 days and hopefully two more uh, by the end of the year. And I would like to tell you a little bit about how uh, everything started for Slovakia and uh, maybe this could serve as a sort of an inspiration for Croatia but hopefully with a little less of the obstacles of the hurdles that Slovakia had to uh, go through and uh, hopefully this lecture will uh, present something that will serve as a, a building block for hopefully a success story for Croatia. So uh, let's rewind back. Uh, to 60s of the uh, past millennium and this is showing scientists at the uh, Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences and they have been very busy, they were working on multiple instruments and devices for Intercosmos program uh, in the, uh, as part of Soviet Czechoslovak uh, space projects. Uh, they were doing all sorts of instruments that were very, very successful. Uh, okay. And the first and most uh, important was the satellite, Magio. This Czechoslovak satellite, as the name suggests, uh, was actually uh, equipped with uh, radiation detectors and it was doing experiments and exploring the magnetosphere and ionosphere of the Earth. Interesting fact is it was uh, launched to space in 1978, which was actually the same year when the Czechoslovak cosmonaut Vladimir Remek also went to space. Uh, this is really important to say because uh, Czechoslovakia was the, third, was the third nation after the Soviets and the US, uh, USA to actually be as a nation in space. Uh, this is let's say, uh, a modern part of the history. Uh, Slovak scientists in 2014 were working on the Rosetta mission, which was a mission that was to land on an asteroid. And Slovak scientists of the Slovak Academy of Sciences developed a communication module um, that was actually uh, helping the communication in between the uh, main probe and the lander on the asteroid. Uh, the thing is, uh, after the split of uh, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic made huge progress uh, and Slovakia's story is a little bit more difficult, uh, but first of all I will tell you a little bit about the context and about the strength of, of uh, Czechoslovakia in that sense. Uh, so this person you know very well, it's Yuri Gagarin and actually Slova uh, Czechoslovakia uh, specifically uh, Prague and Košice were the first international visit of Yuri Gagarin after his uh, journey to space. Uh, and this is a little bit of the Slovak hospitality. <laughs> uh, so this just gives you an idea of how important Czechoslovakia was back then. Uh, this is uh, the first Czechoslovak cosmonaut, uh, Vladimir Remek. His parents were respectively from Czechia and Slovakia, so he was true Czechoslovak. And uh, he was uh, going to space in, as part of these intercosmos missions. Uh, so it is still, uh, let's say, in the 70s, 80s, everything is going very well for uh, Czechoslovakia. And this is 
actually a very, very new uh, photograph uh, of uh, Mr. Vladimir Emek. And he's shaking hands and passing on experience from space to Hurvinek. Hurvinek is actually a puppet uh, that is in, in a, as part of like TV shows, the kids' TV shows in uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic. And he will actually be a passenger on our satellite that we are launching in 13 days. Well, not in this size, but of course uh, in a small two centimeter version. He's made, he's made of glass and he's uh, adding like an educational value to the satellite because the mission is created for uh, Prague planetariums and they are attempting to uh, spark the passion of young people, of young students uh, to <coughs> And even in even the smallest generations, as you can see, uh, to to learn about space, to study uh, space-related technologies and uh, programs. And this is actually uh, the puppet himself, and he's mounted on to the PCB next to a camera that you can see it's covered uh, with the plastic, so that it's not damaged before it goes to space. So that's, uh, that's very uh, nice and we wish for me like a safe flight in a few days. And uh, now let's go back to the history. So you probably also know this guy and this is Eugene Cernan. Uh, we know him in Slovakia as Eugen Černian because his ancestors were actually originally from Slovakia. He was the last man to walk on the moon. And uh, uh, there is an interesting story about how he actually visited Czechoslovakia as well after his famous flight uh, to the moon. Uh, it was obviously a huge uh, communist uh, regime in the Czechoslovakia, so obviously the visit from person uh, from the US was uh, was very difficult. It was a very brave adventure. He came on the on like a press uh, badge uh, to, to Slovakia. He visited his village, Visoka Naurave, and he also brought a Czechoslovak flag that he took to the moon. And this flag he brought as a gift. The problem was that actually no one wanted to take this gift because they would be considered as like conspirators against the regime and whatnot. So uh, there was only one person who accepted this gift. It was the director of the planetarium of uh, Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences. And he placed it on the biggest telescope uh, back then in Czechoslovakia, and still the biggest telescope in Czechia and Slovakia to, to this day. It's a two meter big telescope. But after he was uh, replaced by another director, the flag was taken down and hidden in the storage uh, until the revolution. And this is actually the part when Slovakia and Czech Republic split. Uh, you would think like after these super many missions, uh, instruments and experiments that we did, that Slovakia would have a very uh, nice continuation of the project. But the thing is, it was not so. So uh, Russia uh, or the Soviets had very big debt towards Slovakia. So they offered a place in Soyuz uh, to launch the first Slovak uh, cosmonaut to space. Uh, this was his replacement, Mr. Fuliet, and this is uh, the first Slovak cosmonaut, Ivan Bela. Uh, he went to space in 1999. Uh, and the thing is, this was purely a political show. It was, uh, it had no scientific impact. There was no continuation of his uh, <coughs> like a legacy or anything. Uh, so basically, he just went to space and there was nothing happening afterwards. This brings me to a year uh, 2009, which is 10 years after the flight of Ivan Bella, when uh, the CEO of Space Manic today, uh, but back then, uh, just a regular person, Jakub Kapus, decided to create Slovak Organization for Space Activities with a group of friends as they wanted to change the pace in Slovakia. They wanted to start talk, uh, talking uh, to uh, politicians, start to talk to anyone to start investing in the space sector. There was no space program or no national strategy, nothing in Slovakia back then. And for comparison, in 1996, Czechia already signed the first agreement with ESA. 
So it was it was very weird, and uh, there there was no no interest whatsoever. But how are you going to do it? You are a couple of 20 years old, and you have no money, no contacts, and simply you want to change something about how your country looks at space. So what they did, they started doing uh, some activities, uh, started the website with blog informing about cosmonautics, about the happenings in space. And uh, they started doing what you see here. Uh, they started uh, creating these stratospheric probes. Uh, and they, it happened because uh, Jakob thought about uh, the growing popularity of CubeSats. And he thought, okay, CubeSat would be a fantastic way how to actually push uh, Slovakia uh, to think about space, to, to do something, but uh, how, do, how do we do it and how do we build it? And they had to build it from scratch because they had no money. So they started building electronics that was uh, put on uh, below these balloons. And these stratospheric balloons were like the first step towards uh, space electronics. Uh, what they did and how they actually collected money, uh, these stratospheric balloons uh, actually were equipped with camera and they started shooting commercials uh, in space, you know. And these commercials uh, were then obviously sold and uh, there was a lot of uh, media and universities and people already uh, then uh, on board of the hype. And with this money that they collected, they started pushing the project of the first Slovak satellite. And therefore, uh, the project, after <laughs> many, many years, came to a phase where it was actually ready to be launched. But there was still not enough money. But this is when the Ministry of Education actually stepped in. Uh, and when they saw that there is actually potential uh, with all the activities that were being done, uh, they did pay for the launch, and they did pay for the building of the ground station. This was actually a fantastic momentum, because in 2015, uh, two years prior to launching the satellite, uh, the government of Slovakia actually signed the first ESA agreement, which was fantastic. Uh, and now, a little bit about the first satellite. So it was built completely from scratch. Uh, the idea first came in, in to be, let's say, in 2008, and it took nine years uh, and more to, to just, just push this idea to actually happen. Uh, so the satellite itself, it's a, it's a brand new uh, nano satellite, like you see here. Um, it, was a pro uh, it was just like a pilot project that should move uh, everyone to, to start uh, thinking about space economy. And, uh, space industry as such. Uh, there were many results that we got from this. Uh, first of all, there was popularization aspect promoting science, uh, but there were also spin-off companies actually uh, created on top of the on top of this project, this successful project. And uh, there were obviously some uh, scientific results, uh, and the data are still being processed uh, till this day. Uh, for by various scientific institutions and whatnot. Uh, this is actually just a short, uh, in short pictures, something how, how it happened. There was this prototype rendered, and uh, then the actual assembly uh, and integration to the deployer. It took many many years, so it took uh, from this. Uh, from this first stratospheric balloon probes uh, all the way uh, to the launch in 2017. Uh, there is a little bit of the technical overview. Uh, it is telling you as well about how the satellite was actually built, what was actually uh, developed for this. So we actually did all the onboard, onboard computers, solar panels, the radios, uh, power supply unit, uh, and uh, this took us a lot of time. But it happened, we, we managed to launch the space, and this obviously created so much hype around the project. Uh, we launched with an Indian rocket, and uh, this is a little bit about the results. 
And this is actually telling you about how much time components data is involved in such satellite mission. So the, the team consisted of around 50 people, out of which only 20 uh, people were core team. And all of these were just 12 of them were engineers. And this is actually to highlight the importance of non-technical uh, staff in such projects, because there were lawyers, there were marketers, there were fundraisers. Uh, there were many hurdles on the on the way uh, to launching uh, this satellite because there were no processes established back then in Slovakia. There was no regulation. No one knew how to coordinate frequencies. The telecommunication office didn't know what to do with us. We were the first project of its kind. And therefore, uh, all this had to be made up uh, on the way. And uh, there were... Uh, th there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of programming uh, involved, uh, and over 5,000 components had to be integrated together to just assemble this one little cube. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the importance of this as well is very uh, very much in the uh, promoting of science and education. And this is what I would like to very much highlight, is that there are still lectures made, there are still uh, scientific papers published as a result of this small uh, but powerful mission. This is very much, uh, again, uh, important because there was uh, a lot of politicians uh, involved at the end, obviously, when things were, were happening. There were uh, a lot of media, so finally space was something people were talking about. Uh, even the Chinese press agency informed about our small project. Uh, there is uh, back then the uh, president of Slovakia and as well the uh, prime minister of Slovakia uh, involved. Uh, Again, President Slovakia in the laboratory and at the ground station premises. And we ended up in the school book as well. Uh, so that, that is very, very nice, uh, this, uh, this little cube uh, right here. Uh, this, these nanosatellites, they're, they're definitely an inspiration and a stepping stone. A little bit about the companies that are in Slovakia. So there are four direct Finox uh, companies. One of them is Spacemanic. Uh, there are now companies that, with the gain knowledge and expertise, are applying for ESA projects, uh, ESA FX projects, and they are very successful with it. And there were many ground stations uh, built and laboratories equipped, and the activities have now. Uh, real continuation for Slovakia. This is a small tombstone of the mission. Uh, so it took a lot of time. Uh, maybe now it's done a little faster. And this is why I'd like to tell you a little bit about Space Manic. So the company was established due to natural causes. So once the SK Cube was in space, people came to us and asked, okay, so I want to launch something to space. Can you help us? So we redesigned uh, the whole uh, platform. We redesigned the components uh, to be uh, to be modular, to be plug and play, to be easier. And our mission is to shorten the time needed to launch something to space to less than a year. And then uh, the second Slovak satellite came. We actually did a fantastic partnership with Slovak astrophysicist Norbert Werner. Uh, he is uh, very successful in the field of astrophysics, especially uh, gamma ray bursts uh, detection. And he assembled a team of uh, multiple universities from Japan, scientific organization also from Hungary. Uh, to create a gamma ray, de gamma ray detection device that was mounted on top on top of this one new cube, and actually this satellite was so successful that we actually have five or six uh, gamma ray detections. With this, it, it's been launched in March 2021. It's still active, uh, but obviously the performance uh, deteriorates over time. The 
mission detection so successful that we are now uh, considering launching the GRB beta and later a Camelot fleet uh, of satellites, uh, which will be a fleet of 23 U units that will allow for all sky monitoring. This is a little bit about the uh, mission, uh, but I, would, I promise uh, Professor Vujnovic no small letters, so I will quickly move on. But uh, definitely the modules were, were uh, made smaller and everything was uh, customized with this mission. These are the partners, there's a lot of uh, companies involved, but again, the project is so successful that we believe there will be many, many uh, records, more records to its name uh, in the future as well. This is a little bit about the Camelot fleet that will allow for uh, for, the, for, the, for the monitoring to catch the gamma ray bursts wherever they are coming from. Uh, so this is the closer look on the uh, scintillator that is this gamma ray detection device. And this is just uh, an idea of how these three U satellites could possibly look in the future. Uh, here is the prototype. Uh, this is the picture from April 2019. And actually, on November 2020, uh, GRB, Beta, uh, GRB Alpha was ready to launch. And it was launched on March uh, 2021. So definitely very, very short time to something like this to space. So what's inside? Uh, there, uh, there's a structure, there are solar panels. Uh, we created the uh, power supply unit that was uh, redesigned from the FAQ module module. And there are these very small modules uh, that fit on, two of them fit on the standard PC-104 board. Uh, we have a GNSS receiver for uh, master positioning and time uh, telling uh, as, as this device. Then there is onboard computer for understanding, for, for processing all the data in the computer and giving commands to other modules. Uh, there are some other sensors. Uh, there is an antenna and deployable uh, antenna to communicate uh, with Earth. This is just the overview of how these modules look at the board. So uh, these are two. Uh, these are the onboard computer and GNSS receiver, respectively, on the board. How they look. Uh, and this is actually the uh, younger brother, SK Cube, and GRB Alpha uh, placed next to each other for, for comparison. Uh, of course, each satellite has to undergo a lot of testing prior to be put on the rocket. And all these services are something that we learn along the way and we can also uh, provide as part of our services. So the, mm, the customer basically just comes to us, tell us we want to launch this to space, and we uh, find the launch opportunity, we build it, uh, we test it, and uh, off it goes. Uh, these are all the missions uh, that we are currently, uh, well, that we currently have in space. Uh, this one is the one launching in 13 days, and then there might be some uh, more in the very, very short future. And here I would like to take a moment because the topic of this uh, conference is actually artificial intelligence in space. And I can tell you a little bit about what we in space many see as a potential for uh, AI in the nanosatellites. And uh, the most important use case for us would be uh, processing the data while it's still in space. So we would definitely need uh, some artificial intelligence because of the fact that the number of the satellites is constantly growing and there is so much data that needs to be downloaded and transmitted back to Earth. And there is a lot of useless data, of course, because there are sometimes uh, these Earth observation satellites that simply make a lot of photos and all of these, some are just the blackness, the darkness of space, some are the clouds, some is the water in the sea and you want to actually take picture of the land. So the AI would recognize the things that were the, these pictures while they are still in the satellite, discard the non-usable ones and push only the good ones back to Earth. Uh, 
same uh, thing would be with uh, nanosatellites that are, uh, for example, passing over some sensors that are in the sea, uh, doing some measurements as current of uh, the currents of water in the sea or temperatures. There are some facts that are useless. They are maybe just looking for some anomalies. The artificial intelligence could help, uh, again, separate the good data from the bad data. Uh, or maybe like the last use case, uh, you mentioned the oil wells in the desert. They are sometimes, uh, they're sometimes hundreds of kilometers apart from each other. And of course, you don't have a person just traveling in between them looking for an issue, or you don't, certainly you don't have cables in between them to communicate with all the oil wells in the world. You have a satellite passing over the desert. And they have uh, some, um, some uh, uh, radio devices uh, that will communicate with the satellite and tell them, uh, here's the issue. And the satellite uh, would just collect all this data and tell the ground station back, OK, this one has an issue. So there is plenty of opportunities because the number of satellites is constantly growing. Uh, OK, some, uh, now. Back to Slovakia. So what was next after uh, SKQ? Uh, of course, the politicians were now invested. They wanted to work with uh, Spain. And there was only um, this one institution that was there in Slovakia. It was called, it's, uh, called Tario. It exists for 20 years now. And they are doing uh, all sorts of investment projects and helping companies. Uh, but as uh, Morgan Stanley uh, research shows, by the 2040, the space economy will triple. Uh, they created a standalone Slovak space office institution that is now uh, dealing exclusively with space topics and trying to lure in investment projects in the, uh, in the sense of uh, space economy. They have multiple uh, things that they are dealing with. They are helping the companies that are already in the sector. They are doing what it's called spinning in. So companies that are not in space ecosystem, they are spinning them in. They are helping them find the opportunities uh, how to sell whatever product or services they have into uh, the ecosystem. They are helping the companies that are just working in Slovakia uh, finding partners abroad and uh, just overall internalization, uh, internationalization of the project altogether. There is currently uh, about 40 companies involved in a space ecosystem in Slovakia. 50% uh, approximately is upstream, 50% is downstream. Downstream deals mostly with Earth observation data processing or navigation positioning data. And upstream is obviously uh, satellite components, manufacturing, ground segment, launch segment. Uh, the other things that the space office is doing is uh, they are um, participating and organizing uh, various uh, events. So the most important would be definitely IAC in Dubai and Paris. And there would be as well ESA Industry Day. Uh, they are also attending non-space events, for example, like Expo, uh, which had a theme Space Week, uh, where they actually organized for us uh, multiple networking opportunities. They brought delegations of other countries and helped us uh, find international partners, uh, meeting with foreign space agencies and whatnot. And there is one. Uh, event that they uh, organized since 2019, that's Emerging Space. Uh, it's divided into uh, themes and again dealing with all kinds of new space uh, topics, uh, bringing uh, fantastic uh, possibilities for all the Slovak companies. So this is... Uh, uh, and now for the, for the most important part and why we are here uh, today, uh, what's next for Croatia? Uh, so please allow me uh, for in this uh, nice event today to introduce to you Krokiv. And Krokiv is the project that uh, I came up with uh, and I decided 
to connect two actors in this process, uh, Spade Manning and the organizer of today's event, Adriatic Aerospace Association. Uh, so uh, my CEO, uh, the founder of Slovak Organization for Space Activities and the father of SK Cube, uh, Jakub Kapusz and president of uh, Adriatic Aerospace Association, uh, Mr. Danko Bosat, signed the memorandum to, uh, to build and launch the first Croatian nanosatellite. This first uh, satellite uh, will be one new unit and it will carry an optical payload, a camera uh, that will uh, do Earth observation, take pictures of the Earth. We want to mm, make this data public uh, to spark the interest of Croatian uh, youth, of Croatian institutions and government to simply create the momentum to copy the success story of Slovakia that would enable for Croatia to take this first step for creating a successful ecosystem. We plan to launch in the second half of next year. This is the mission path. And of course, where there is good plan, there's always a lack of money. So what I would like to use this opportunity for is to tell you that we are going to launch in the upcoming months a big crowdfunding campaign where everyone will be able to take part in launching and building the first Croatian satellite. Uh, and I have a fantastic team of professionals that I've assembled. I'm, I'm super happy about it. Uh, I think that it will be uh, the, the most amazing way how to push uh, Croatia uh, away from the constant brain drain and start looking into very smart projects and be a pilot project for many ambitious projects that Adriatic Aerospace Association has uh, and uh, other scientific institutions in Croatia as well. We already have a website. You can already get in touch with us. We'd be very happy. And that would be everything from me. And I will be uh, very happy to talk to you after the event. And wish us luck. Thank you, Daniela, very much. Awesome presentation. And uh, now I would like to invite. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, uh, just, 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 just